characteristics um, to studying wildlife in their natural habits and ha habitats and how we can um, pull information out of soundscape recordings. So humans aren't much different than animals. We use sound to communicate um, a lot of information. It's how we interpret our world. It's how we communicate with each other. And animals are no different. Um, animals make a range of different sounds for a variety of different reasons. So if we look at birds as an example, um, birds make territorial calls to warn out other individuals. This is my spot. This is not your spot. Um, they advertise for mates. Um, and often these will involve elaborate displays. But the sound is a very critical component of that, particularly in birds. And it also conveys information of physiological state. So nestlings that are hungry will use sound to um, tell their parents that it's, it's time for feeding. So this is something that um, was sort of understood by a lot of ecologists. But how we interpret those sounds and how we um, can monitor those sounds is something that was really brought to light with um, Rachel Carson's book, Silent Spring. So how many of you have heard of Rachel Carson before? handful of you. Oh, a lot more. Good. Excellent. So Rachel Carson was an aquatic biologist um, based in the U.S. and she's one of the first people to kind of popularize um, the importance uh, and impacts of DDT um, in environments. And the way that she did this was through this book called Silent Spring. And the reason it's called Silent Spring is because she noticed and was very eloquently, eloquently at explaining um, that bird singing activity has decreased. Um, and the links to that decrease were associated with increased use of pesticides. And so um, she has a very famous quote in her book, um, over increasingly large areas of the United States, spring now comes unheralded by the return of the birds, and the early mornings are strangely silent, where once they were filled with the beauty of bird song. And so Rachel in this book, um, and, and many other people have made this point as well, is that we can really use the sounds of nature as an indicator of the health of our ecosystems. And this is sort of how I got into the field of ecoacoustics, is how can we actually use the sounds that birds in particular, but also other species, um, can help us understand the health of our ecosystems, particularly in Australia. And so this first starts um, the technological part of the sound and how we record sound. And this has changed dramatically over the years. Uh, for those of you who are a little bit older, you may recognize some of these methods um, that have been used in the past. Um, Murray Littlejohn, who is a famous ecologist who studies frogs, has been doing this work for many years, since the 50s. Um, and, and the methods that we collect data has changed dramatically over the years. So a lot of these examples here are um, specifically aimed at recording individuals in their environment. So the 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 point of it is really to kind of capture an individual calling. We've kind of shifted away from that. Well, we still do that, but we've shifted to a broader um, approach to studying sound. And we're really trying to capture the sounds of a collective ecosystem, so the soundscape. Um, this has changed even in the six years I've been working in this field. Um, the first recorders we were using at the museum were the ones that you see on your upper left. These are called song meters. Um, they've taken um, different um, routes to get to uh, recording the same information. Um, so basically, these are just microphones that have small processors and batteries and SD cards. They all have the same characteristics. The current way that we record bird sounds now or animal sounds now is something that fits into the palm of your hand. So the one that's in the bottom middle right there, do you see that one? It's called an audio moth. That's, this is how big it is. So the size of them has changed dramatically. The cost has gone down dramatically. So these units cost about 50 US dollars. The ones on the upper left cost about $1,000 when they first came out. So this is something that we're actually very quickly approaching a scalable type of approach for recording animals, something that we really didn't expect to happen quite so quickly. So it's, it's been a lot of technological advancement very, very recently. So what can we do with these automated recorders? So these actually can be programmed. So we can record, if we're interested in the dawn chorus of birds, then we can program them to record in the morning. If we're interested in our boreal mammals that only vocalize at night, we can record them at night. Um, and they're really great because they're 
uh, non-invasive, so you just sort of put them out there um, and then they can record. It doesn't involve people going out there to check them. It's a very sort of benign way of recording the environment. They're very cost-effective, so even though the initial outlay is really expensive, it's not the same cost as having someone go out there every day to record the birds or other animals. I'm biased towards birds, sorry. Um, and the, the one of the really great things, though, is that it can actually capture the sounds of different habitats, different locations over long periods of time. So we can really start to get at that idea of how are our environments tracking over large geographic spaces and over time. And that's sort of where um, a lot of the new insights are coming um, into the ecoacoustics field. Coming from a museum, we're really interested in providing permanent records of species presences. And these recordings do that because you can actually archive the sound files and they become a record of a species. And also something that's been really in, um, sort of insightful um, is, is the ability to detect things that are really rare. So things that, uh, species that don't call very often, if you have a recorder out that can record for six months to a year, some of these actually record permanently, um, it's more likely that you're gonna detect that species. And that's becoming really important for a lot of species that are moving across landscapes very quickly. They only show up for a little while. Um, and so having the ability to kind of keep the pulse of the ecosystem going um, is really, really important. So now I'm just gonna give you a little bit of um, an example of some of the sounds that we've cataloged um, as part of these projects. These are very different locations. But I'm just gonna give you a sort of an overview of a 24-hour of a period that's gonna start in Melbourne and it's gonna end up in Indonesia. So just want you to sit back and relax and just open your ears to the next, I think it's about two minutes, so. So how many of you know at least one species that was in those recordings? It sounds familiar to you. I hope at least one. Cow, Cow yeah. 
That's an interesting one. That's going to come back later, so keep that one in mind. So clearly there's biological information in each of those um, recordings. We know where those recordings took place. We know when they were recorded. And we know that there is sounds that animals um, are producing in those recordings that we want to then pull that information out. So then the next part about eco the field of ecoacoustics, sorry, I think I may have just, yes, I pushed the wrong button, sorry. There we go. How do we actually pull that information out? And so this is where most of the development for the field of ecoacoustics is really, really active. And this is some of the most exciting work that we get to do, um, is how we actually go from audio data to biological data. And so the way that we actually can do that is by visualizing sound or creating what we call spectrograms. How many of you have heard this terminology used before? Fantastic, perfect. So the image on the right is actually one of the first published spectrograms for at least bird literature. Um, and really, um, spectrograms are just uh, a representation of the sound by looking at the spectrum of frequencies that are produced over time. And um, what I've tried to represent in this little graphic on the left is that the change in the amplitude of the call or the intensity, how loud it is, can actually be mapped onto the spectrogram as well. And so in many of the spectrograms that you'll see um, subsequently, the color actually tells you a bit more information too. So the way that we have shown spectrograms historically, um, these are actually kind of stylized because there wasn't a really good way of visualizing them um, electronically back then. And so a lot of people actually did um, handwritten spectrograms. They traced the patterns um, onto uh, paper that then they published. Spectrograms look a little bit different nowadays. This is an example of the magpie. Um, and so this is essentially the same thing that you just saw, but this is an actual image. Um, and so the purple colors are sort of quieter, cool frequencies, um, and the really warm colors are the sort of more intense ones. So I'm just going to play a clip of this um, magpie, and you can kind of get an, an idea of how to read them, so you can sort of imagine what the sound is by looking at the spectrogram. <laughs> So you can sort of see the pattern, and you can see really clearly that's a very unique pattern. Well, if we look at another example, so here's a koala. This is what a koala sounds like and looks like. Just going. <laughs> So you can see there, there's already a very different pattern, right? And so you can sort of see that better than you can necessarily hear it. So it's really these differences um, between individual calls that we can use to help identify which species are found in which recordings. And so you can go from those soundscapes into something that's sort of like this. We can start to put identifications around each of the sounds that we are able to pick up in the recordings. Okay, so each, each one of these species is a slightly different sound. Um, each one of them has a slightly different pattern. So the information that we can pull out of these um, acoustic recordings um, has many different applications, um, anywhere from a species, so we can identify individual species in recordings, but we can also ask questions about communities. These are sort of summaries um, we can generate from the soundscapes. And then we can use that information to kind of get a, a handle on how soundscapes vary across landscapes and what other kind of patterns can we find from that. So I'm going to give you some examples of the work that we've been doing across these different scales. And this is mostly within a project, sort of a broad research program called Listening for Nature. Um, and then I'll highlight three main themes around those different scales. One is monitoring threatened species, assessing biodiversity, um, and engaging communities. And so the community part actually kind of spans all of those different scales of analysis. And I'll give you examples across each one of those um, at the end. So the Listening for Nature project is, is a fairly large one. We have lots of partners that we work with. We have a lot of different um, backgrounds um, that help us collect the data, analyze the data, and interpret the data. Um, and really, it's 
primarily focused around building capacity and skills within Victoria and also overseas to kind of use acoustic monitoring for a range of different projects. So we've worked with people about um, improving the way that we record um, animals, both soundscapes and individual species. Um, how we analyze the sound, both the species um, automated recognition, which I'll talk about next, um, and also the metrics we can generate from the soundscapes themselves. We also do training projects where we teach researchers about the information that we've gathered, um, how the different methodologies work. Um, and this actually goes down to the land managers as well, so they can actually start incorporating acoustic monitoring into their uh, monitoring programs. And really it's about developing a set of standards and a, and a sort of transferability of the data and the understanding so that we can sort of collectively use this as a, as a better and better tool for um, documenting biodiversity. So I'll start um, with the first example of threatened species. So how many of you people, how many of you might know what this bird is? Yes, I see some nods. Okay, this is a night parrot drawing from Gould's book. Um, I'm not actually working on night parrots, but I'm sort of bringing out the idea that um, acoustics has actually helped us um, find really rare things, things that we thought were extinct. Um, so what we're working on in Victoria is not the night parrot, but it brings out this idea of the, the anyone know what this bird is actually? Yes, plains wanderer, great. So the plains wanderer is a little bird that we have, um, actually one of, a, one of the last remaining populations in Victoria. Um, it is an extremely unique species. It's found only in Australia. It's the only member of its family. Um, it's critically endangered um, in Australia and has just been recognized by the Zoological Society of London as being one of the most evolutionarily distinct and globally endangered species. It is the number one bird on their list out of 100. This is not the list you want to be on. Um, why are they going... Um, ex well, they're not going extinct, but why are they threatened? Uh, primarily because they live in a threatened habitat, um, which is native grasslands, which we don't have many left. And they're a very small little bird. Um, this is where they live. They live in the plains. Um, in Victoria, the Path of the Plains is one of the primary areas. Um, and they're particularly um, amenable to acoustic monitoring, primarily because they're really cryptic, they're hard to find. Um, they occur at very low densities, so the idea of being able to put a recorder out and sort of try and capture the sounds of them um, is a really appealing thing. Um, and just to give you an idea of how rare they are, the, the map on the right is a distribution map, and they're really only found in a few key locations. Um, what we're trying to do actually with this project is figure out if we find them in new places um, that we haven't thought to survey before. So I'll get to that a little bit in the end. So how do we go out and record plains wanderers? Well, a lot of the habitat that they're in is actually pasture land. And so we have worked with uh, the Department of Environment, Water, Land, and Planning um, and some researchers associated with DELP um, to deploy these recorders in a range of sites where we both know that they occur or we suspect they might occur because of the habitat requirements that they have. And so does anyone imagine why there's a big cage around this one? to keep the cows from knocking over the recorders. There's some issues with birds too, but um, primarily the cows um, are an issue. So we don't want these getting knocked over. So once we've collected the data, the soundscapes themselves don't tell us automatically where the species we're interested in is. We have to figure out how to pull that data out. So this is where automated species recognition comes in. And so this is really just a computer processing um, program or application um, that builds a model around what we say the species sounds are. So in this case, we use a yellow-faced honey eater and we say these are all yellow-faced honey eater calls. Build me a model about the yellow-faced honey eater. And then we put it into a program and then it builds us this model and then we can use that model to scan all of our field recordings. And then it should tell us where um, we actually have detections. Now mind you, these aren't perfect methods. Um, they are pretty good at picking up the presence of species, but sometimes they miss calls. And so a lot of work is around how to best build these models to most efficiently and effectively detect the species. So this is what a plains wanderer looks like, uh, a plains wanderer call looks like, sorry. Um, it is a very low frequency call. It has a very, very di diagnostic and characteristic sound. 
Um, and it's actually distinguishable from other species that occur in that location, like a stubble quail. So from the work that we've done with DELP, we've actually surveyed um, 38 sites. And this is really sort of a pilot study. Can we actually use the technology to help detect the species? So we, well, I didn't, but um, our collaborators put out um, 38 different, at 38 different sites, recorders, recorded for about six months. Um, and then we used the um, data that we collected to see whether or not they were actually de detected in each of those sites. Um, the recognizer actually detected the presence of plains wanderers in half of the sites that we um, surveyed, which is sort of surprising because we knew that they were in seven of the sites, but six of those sites, we hadn't actually, or the visual service hadn't detected them in, um, I think at the time that the data were collected was about two and a half years. So no, so basically we thought that they weren't at those sites. And then six additional sites, had they had never been detected before. So you can imagine that the ability to use acoustics to find new populations or new sites is a really important when you're trying to conserve habitat and protect a species. So the best thing for this, though, is whether or not we actually are able to... Oh, sorry, here. I always read this one. This is what the Plains Wanderer sounds like at those sites. It actually surprisingly sounds a lot like a cow. Um, and if you recall the recording I played earlier, the Patho Plains one, there was a Plains Wanderer calling really quietly in the background. So that's the sound that we're looking for. Um, the important thing, though, is that we want to make sure that our acoustic survey methods are at least comparable and hopefully slightly better than the visual surveys. And from the work that we've done for this species, that's the case. Every time they were detected at a site visually, we also detected them on the recording. So that's a really encouraging result. And so we were also able to find, though, that in sites where they were detected or weren't detected by visual surveys, they were detected by acoustics. And that means that we can actually go back to those sites and put in a little bit more effort to get the demographic data. You know, are there individuals breeding on that site? That, that kind of data, too. So, so this is, is a complementary method to visual surveys. It's not an exclusive method, but it can actually really extend um, the reach of surveys. So we're also working on um, the same sort of approach for a bunch of different species. Um, uh, some of that work will be with frogs. And so this is a picture of a growling grass frog. We're working with um, Winton wetlands. Um, and they're in, uh, really sort of interested in um, bringing growling grass frogs into a reclaimed habitat. And so we need to kind of establish first whether there are already growling grass frogs there, but also um, when they become established, how they move across the landscape. So this is a really unique opportunity to kind of put in a monitoring protocol before the actual work starts. So I'll just give you a clip of this. This is what the spectrogram looks like. It's a little bit loud, so brace yourself. This is a great call. So it's just really easy to find um, in the spectrograms. And a lot of the work that we do, um, even when we're not using the computer programs to find them for us, is actually scanning spectrograms. And that's actually a lot faster than, than listening to the recordings. So. so I'll move on to the next phase. So that's sort of at the species level. The next phase is um, more about assessing, um, from a soundscape level, um, the species richness at a site. And so this is where we're going to move away from just the work that we're doing in Victoria. And I'll use an example from Sulawesi, Indonesia, to kind of illustrate the power of this approach. So the way that we can draw information out of the spectrograms for this type of analysis is not by identifying each individual species, but by identifying um, the variety of sounds that are in those soundscapes. And so if you have a really complex soundscape, the assumption is that you have more species making those sounds. If you have a really you know, simple soundscape, then the expectation is there are fewer species making sounds. And there's a bit of nuance around that, but that's basically the fundamental principle. And so on the right, you have some examples of complex soundscapes and um, non-complex soundscapes. And so we can really use that as a proxy um, for a species richness. So sites that have complex soundscapes, we will assume have, slight, have higher species richness. And the ones that are less complex have lower species richness. And so to do this project, we really wanted to go to a place that has a gradient in sound um, 
scapes that probably reflect species richness gradients. Um, and so one of the places that we work for other projects um, is in an area called um, Wallacea, or um, in particular, uh, the area in Indonesia. And so Indonesia is very important for a lot of reasons, but um, for faunal interchange, it's actually sort of a melting pot of different types of um, organisms. So like you get the species that have diversified within Asia and Africa, and they just start to make it into Indonesia before they get replaced by um, species groups that are actually diversified in Australia, and they blend together. And the place that they blend the most is in the island of Sulawesi. Um, but unfortunately, so for biodiversity hotspots, one of the characteristics is that they have high species richness or high species diversity, but that they're also um, threatened habitats. And so across Indonesia, there's a lot of pressure um, with population growth um, and the activities for extraction. And so this is an area where the species um, diversity is not well known. So we're really trying to find ways to more efficiently document that before we see these changes happening. And then we can really kind of assess how these impacts are um, affecting the landscapes. So this is the island of Sulawesi. It's smack dab between the Asian continents and the Australian continent. Um, it's very topographically complex. There's many mountain ranges that are above 3,000 meters. Um, and it has a very complex geology. It's sort of an accretion of many different land masses. So it's, it sets the stage for a really amazing and interesting location. Um, there are amazing habitats from seas all the way up to these moss forests that you see in the upper right-hand side. Um, so you can imagine that the diversity that we'd find there is, is really dramatic. And so this is just a really snapshot of some of the endemic species that are found in that island. Um, so the importance of it biologically is really critical. So how do we go to these locations and figure out the species uh, diversity? Well, some of the work that I've been doing um, on Sulawesi has been really geared towards the acoustic surveys. So on the left-hand side is an example of some of the recorders that we've had out at different locations. We've gone to several different um, sites within Sulawesi, and we're really looking to um, record the soundscapes across elevational gradients. And so that's mo primarily because they also capture variation in habitat, um, and there are also predictable patterns of species richness across those elevational habitats. And in particular, these are really great approaches because we have the on-the-ground biological data to compare them to. So at the same time that we're doing the acoustic recordings, we're also looking at um, birds um, in individual sites. So we can map back the number of species we see at a site with what the acoustic diversity metric is telling us. So this is a, a project that uh, my former master's student worked on, and she was really interested in testing a different, um, several different acoustic diversity metrics. There really isn't a standard um, metric that we're using yet. We're sort of, sort of trying out different acoustic metrics across different habitat types. And so she really um, t tested three main ones. One's called acoustic complexity index, one's a number of frequency peaks, and one's acoustic richness. It's just a difference in the way that it actually crunches the numbers on the spectrograms. And so what she was able to do was to compare the value that was generated by each index with the species count at each of those sites. And so for at least one, there was a significant relationship where the species count went up when the acoustic diversity metric went up. And that's really what we're looking for. Um, but what we also found, though, is that um, where there was a tight relationship between the elevation and the acoustic complexity index, which is also what we see in the species richness. So if we can use elevation as a proxy for species richness, then we can also look to see whether or not the acoustic indices are following that same pattern. So this was on one mountain. What we find when we look at other mountains, though, is that the patterns don't always hold. And so for acoustic complexity in Latimojong, is not the same pattern that we see for Katopasa or Tornpupu. And so already we know that that's not going to be a great metric across Sulawesi. Um, so we start looking at the other metrics to see whether or not they better capture that relationship. So this is really just a plot of the elevation um, and the index value. So we expect a nice linear decline um, that should match the elevation profile. And so in this case, the two mountains that worked uh, the, two, the index that worked really well on those mountains was actually acoustic richness. So now we're testing a bit more about 
Um, are we specifying parameters differently that actually causes these relationships to fall apart? Or is it really that we're, when we start looking at larger data sets that we're finding different patterns emerging? So this is sort of a, um, a field that's rapidly developing. Um, it's not just the work that we're doing here in Australia. There's a lot of other work going on around the, um, the world that are really trying to get at what are these really um, robust measures that we can use to capture species richness really quickly. So that um, sort of wraps up the acoustic biodiversity. And I'll give you another example of the work we're doing in um, um, Victoria around that with our community groups. But I really kind of want to spend the last part here discussing how we can actually use these um, acoustic principles and methods to really engage um, general pub members of the public, really, um, with understanding the birds in their background, in their backyards, as well as um, how they can start using these technologies to apply for their own um, questions in their own backyards. And so what we've done is actually have a partner project with the Victorian National Parks Association called Communities Listening for Nature. And this is really a um, sort of a, a co-collaborative project that we developed with the NPA to kind of apply the methods and understanding of acoustic monitoring and then see whether or not our community groups can take over the role of doing that. And so what we've done is we've developed a really specific model for reaching out to community groups that we already have strong associations with. This is where VNPA really shines. Um, and then we work with those groups to say, okay, what are the questions that are in your own backyard that you're really interested in asking? So some groups are interested in looking at threatened species. Um, and each one of these is, is based around a, a public land, so um, a state park or a national park. And then they kind of lead the way in terms of what are they interested in doing. So we let them decide what their main research question is. We help develop the study design so that the results that they get are actually statistically scientific. Um, and then we help them with learning how to use the equipment. Now they take the recorders, they do all the data collection. So we train them how to use the recorders. They go out and deploy them, they record all the data, and they send them back to us and then we analyze them. And so there's really sort of a, a multi-stage approach where the community is really the one driving the data collection, and the museum is really just analyzing it, archiving it, and then providing that information back to them. And then collectively, we can actually address the questions that they're really interested in. So this is slightly different than your sort of typical citizen science approach where um, we're having very short-term engagement. This is a very long-term, a lot of the projects, or a lot of the groups that we've been working with, we've been working it with for all three years. Um, so we have very long-term um, engagement with these groups. So I'm just going to give you a snapshot of some of the projects. This is the five groups that we've worked with over the last three years, um, primarily around public lands. Uh, the Mount Alexander group is a little bit different because they have a series of properties that we're working with, and they're asking um, questions um, that are on a different scale of some of the other groups. But I'll give you some examples. So right now, we're actually in the analysis stage for some of these groups, for the three on the left, so Mount Alexander, Wombat, and Brisbane Ranges. We're just analyzing that data now, so there's more to come for those. But I'll give you a, um, a brief rundown of some of the work from Bunyip um, and the Mount Worth projects, which are just wrapping up now. So the great thing about the Communities Listening for Nature project is that we're able to address questions across each of these three levels with one project. And so what we've been able to do is generate species lists. And so some of these sites actually include threatened species, which is important for the community members. Um, we use the data we've collected to actually test questions about ecological gradients within and between sites. Um, and then we can sort of scale that up to landscapes as well. So some of the species that our groups are interested in, um, we actually have some um, an interest in Mount Alexander was actually for something that we don't get a lot of interest in from other projects, which is actually nocturnal birds. And so we don't really know a lot about the distribution of nocturnal birds within Victoria, primarily because the data that we collect um, is often during the daytime. And so these species vocalize primarily at night. Um, and so a lot of the work that we're doing is actually trying to build knowledge of where they're found. And, and the greatest thing is that um, for a lot of the projects, they're actually on private land, so someone has someone who's in the community group has a private paddock 
or a, you know, a bush block that they're interested in knowing what species are there. And they're really surprised to find out that they thought they had a boo book. Most people think that they have boo books on their property. But we actually found five different nocturnal species on one property. So it's a really sort of eye-opening moment for a lot of these community members. Um, and then that excitement kind of goes back to um, sending me emails every day. I heard this one, I heard that one. So it's really exciting to see that, that back and forth play between um, what we were able to provide to them and how they actually use that in their everyday lives. So these are just two examples of the species that we're finding um, in those recordings. Um, within Bunyip, now this one's a particularly poignant one and I'll sort of get to that at the end given what's happened in Bunyip recently. Um, but we were able to use this acoustic complexity. So acoustic complexity index works really well in the data sets that we're working on here. Um, so we've been using that pretty standard across some of the um, projects that we're working on. So you can ask, you can actually, so before I was just sort of looking at acoustic complexity index as a way to kind of a snapshot of the species richness at a site. But if you look at it throughout the day, it actually can give you a pattern of the singing activity. So you can see when are birds calling most frequently, um, when are they quiet, and how does that vary over sites. <coughs> so to give you, so the graphs on the right are slightly different than the ones you've seen before. The one on the, the um, y-axis is the ACI again, this is that acoustic index. And on the bottom of the graph is actually the time of day. And so I've highlighted, these are actually recordings done over a very long period of time. So there is a mark for sunrise, so that little yellow window is sunrise. So it's not always the same time for the recordings. And then the blue is actually sunset. So you can really cl clearly see that there are differences between sites in when the peak activity is. Um, they generally all show a dawn chorus. These are all um, recorded during spring, during the breeding season for birds. So you would expect that there would be an uptake in um, activity during that time period. But interestingly, some also show this increase um, during the nighttime as well. So if you're trying to go out and survey birds and you were doing it visually, um, then you would know which time of the day is the best to capture the most species. Um, so you can actually follow this data up to say, okay, we know that there are a lot of species, but what are those species? So you can go out and do that. Um, and then Another project we've been doing at Bunyip, so Bunyip has a series of long-term monitoring sites that they've been looking at for a long time, and so they're really interested in how species richness varies across a gradient of vegetation. And so Victoria is broken up into different categories of vegetation we call EVCs or ecological vegetation classes. And we really were just interested to see, well, do we find distinct patterns um, between the different EVCs? Well, for, for one, we also are able to see that Clearly, damp forests show a lot of variation in their species richness over time or their acoustic richness over time, whereas we have narrower variation and sometimes lower variation in some of these other habitats. So that green one, the first green one, is, is lowland forest. The ones that are just a bar are only because we have only one replicate in that um, EVC. So we can try to, you know, we'll sort of build the data set up with other locations to kind of get a better idea of the variation in that. But clearly you can see that there are, there are patterns that differ between the different sites and the different vegetations. We're also doing the same thing with Mount Worth. Um, they were more interested in um, revegetation efforts that they've been doing over um, a period of time. So within the park itself doesn't have revegetation, but the surrounding areas, they've been working a lot to revegetate their properties. And they really wanted to get a handle of are their revegetation efforts actually, actually having an impact on the bird communities? And they were one of our most motivated groups. They actually collected um, acoustic data all year long. And so we have, I think the last estimate was about four terabytes of data, of acoustic data. So not just the information that we're pulling out of it, but the data that's available for other people to look at is, is really getting big. So what we found with their data is there were really strong patterns between different revegetation categories um, in the spring, which we might have expected. And um, something that's not surprising to me, but maybe surprising for some people, is that these early revegetation categories actually have high species richness or higher um, diversity metrics indices. Primarily because you have um, sort of a transition between two different communities. So you're, you're in the transition between um, one vegetation type to another. Um, and those patterns sort of disappear in the summer. And so when you survey actually can also have an impact on the patterns that you find through that. So we're gonna add the um, winter data and the autumn data to this soon. So we'll really see whether or not there are particular 
revegetation categories that have the same patterns or whether these sort of um, decouple at different times of year. So I hope you can see from um, what I presented tonight is that we're really trying to do a lot um, with the data that we're collecting. And certainly we're generating data on a scale that um, we can't all analyze. And there may be questions that we can address with the data that we've collected um, that we haven't even thought of yet. And so that's one of the beauties of working at a museum is that we're actually able to put these sound recordings in a location that can be accessed by other researchers, other community groups, um, scientists in 10 years time, 20 years time, as technologies develop, as information changes, as landscapes change. And so what we've done at Museums Victoria is build a wildlife sounds, um, sounds library. And this is a little bit different than your typical wildlife sounds library because we're not focused primarily on individual species calls. We're primarily focused on the soundscapes themselves. And so if you are interested in looking at the data from Bunyip, you can go to our website and say communities listening for nature and the project associated with Bunyip will come up and then the files that we've collected associated with that um, will show up there too. So it's really sort of leaving a legacy of the project um, for the museum, but also for the people of Victoria and Australia to use um, in the future. So when I said that Bunyip um, questions that we were asking is really poignant and that's in particular because of what's happened recently in the Bunyip State Park. Um, more than 15,000 hectares have just burned and the fire is now just contained. So you can see already that there's going to be a massive change to the landscape. And now that we have that pre-fire data, we can start to go back and look at how is Bunyip recovering over time. And so acoustic data in many ways is a benchmark. Um, and then if we re regularly monitor, then we can sort of map how that's changed and how it impacts um, across those communities. So in addition to the project um, with communities listening for nature, I also have a student who's working in this area. So it'll be interesting to see what his data are showing. So I just want to kind of wrap up with, uh, um, I hope you sort of understand a bit about how the acoustic field of acoustic monitoring is really rapidly changing, but it is perfectly suited to address a wide range of different um, questions that are we're dealing with right now. And I, I hope that um, this will inspire some of you to kind of look further into these methods and see how these could be applied to the work you're interested in. I mean, a lot of, I get a lot of interest too, is soundscapes have very powerful emotional um, appeal to people as well. And so this is just a resource that's available for people to use. And really I sort of highlight that there are going to be future approaches for um, how we analyze this data. This is what's happening right now. Um, machine learning. I'm sure people are aware of deep machine learning. They're already starting to use this um, for a lot of other related projects, but it's just now sort of hitting the um, acoustic monitoring from, for animals. Um, and I really think that a lot of uh, sort of the fruitful research around this area is going to just be amazing in terms of how much data we're able to extract from um, the data that we've already collected. So this will be an exciting space to watch if any of you are deciding what careers to go into. This would be a really good one. Um, it's a really amazing thing what people can do with this. It's just a matter of um, putting the computer scientists in touch with the biologists to kind of bring those two fields together. So that's really all I have tonight. I just wanted to um, thank you for coming. Thank you, Karen, for a fascinating uh, insight into the world of sound. Um, now we have some time for questions uh, so that we can all hear and including our ex external audience can hear. Uh, I'd ask you to wait until a, a microphone comes to you. Um, so yeah, we've got about uh, 15 minutes where we can have some questions. Who'd like to start us off? This is actually a question from the live stream. It's come in uh, via Twitter. Karen, uh, a curator curious is interested to know um, how you decide where you're going to be um, placing the recorders. Ah, interesting. So there are a, um, there are some you know easy ones like 
recorders should be roughly placed at about ear height. So a lot of what we're doing with acoustics is really testing the methodologies and comparing it to uh, point count surveys, so the, the, the sort of audiovisual way that we use individual people to record, recorder, um, to record birds in particular. Um, and so we generally place recorders on standing existing structures. We don't often um, use them to, you know, to put something into the ground. Um, and generally I try to put them in locations that have good access for sound detection. So along a road is not a good place unless you're interested in how sound is impacted by road use. Um, but a lot of times it's not too far away from a road because it has to have easy access. So there's really no... Oftentimes there's no rhyme or reason except for a couple, um, you know, key rules about where to put them. But I think that there's a lot of um, development that's now needs to be done about um, where is the best place to put them. So we kind of know where we can put them. But, you know, it could be that if you're interested. So for Sulawesi, there's a lot of birds that call in the canopy. And so we're probably not detecting the same species at the ground level that we could detect in the canopy. So we're trying to do some work where we can actually, um, you know, bring recorders up into the canopy and record the species that we find there. And I bet we're going to find very different, um, very different soundscapes up there. So it's sort of, sort of, it's a bit of a black box voodoo, but you kind of, you still get data no matter where you put them. Good evening, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, I, I'm thinking of this whole soundscape uh, and in a, in, a, in a dimensional uh, manner, uh, linking to the previous question. Has someone mentioned or thought about putting an array of microscopes, uh, not microscopes, um, microphones, yeah. and, then, and then with the difference in when the timestamp is, determining where the birds are yes and and are they currently has it already been developed or um it's sort of there's a couple different ways that you can approach that so you could actually have the same recorder um in a grid and then you sort of mathematically calculate when the call arrives at each of those recorders and then you can kind of get an idea of where an individual is calling from in the landscape um, there are also different projects that look at having multiple microphones in each direction. So you have a single point with a lot of information around it. Um, and those ways, um, that can actually provide information about where um, an individual is. So part of the reason why you would do an array um, is to kind of get at that idea of where are individuals calling from so you can map it out. And there are developing methods for inferring abundance using those arrays, which is... Um, one of the downsides of acoustic recording is that oftentimes we record in mono because when you record in stereo, you have twice as much file space. Um, but also, you can't really tell which direction it's coming from unless you have an array. So I would say that that's another field that's being actively developed. I mean, we're still developing the protocols for these, um, and any research that comes out in that field is actually really helpful. Yeah. How can schools help and get involved? That's a good question. Um, we haven't developed a project specifically around schools, primarily because we're sort of trialed how well a variety of different types of people could um, engage with this. Um, there are apps other places than Australia, like everyone's saying, when am I going to get the Shazam for bird calls? Um, there are apps designed to actually have people record um, bird calls and there's I think the frog ID app from, from the Australian Museum is actually good at that is is having people individually record a call that they hear the frog and then it sends to their database so we haven't worked in that space yet but I think that there's a lot of opportunity to kind of capture soundscapes across Victoria in particular um, from different people so so it's in the back burner but we haven't we haven't actually pursued that just yet Thank you, thank you. Karen, this is really interesting, and especially for me, because I'm worried that I'll be redundant as a field ornithologist in the future. Um, but a couple of points. Uh, your software, is it good enough to tell when it's a liar bird it's recording? That's always the question I get. No, it's not. <laughs> so, and I think it, the idea that we're going to suddenly put... Um, wildlife biologists out of work is is slightly unnecessary because 
first of all, there's a lot of information that you can't get from the audio recordings that um, wildlife biologists can still provide. So when I said that um, we know that we can detect plains wanderers with the acoustic recorders, it still doesn't tell us where they are on that landscape. It doesn't tell us whether they're breeding. It doesn't tell us whether there's a male on that site because the males aren't the ones that vocalize. So I think the idea of them being ex mutually exclusive is not happening. It's more that it's a way that we can quickly survey a large area and then figure out where that skilled infer you know, people need to go to kind of pull out that more information. But lyre birds are always going to be a problem. And so the question really then becomes, um, are there other ways that we can pull that call out and then have someone specifically listen to it to say, oh, well, because you've got four different calls in a row and they're about the same amplitude, I'm guessing that that's actually calling from the same location, which is probably a lyre bird. But yeah, that's definitely, uh, mimics are definitely a problem for these sort of methods. Fair enough. I worked for a long time with uh, bat detectors. Mm -hmm. And I know, I'm quite aware that um, we kept finding bats that, the experts told us would not be in those areas. So that um, software is being rewritten all the time to try and yeah. keep up with the, the standard of accuracy. But um, no, I'm reassured, so thank you for that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's definitely a lot um, that has to happen around the accuracy and the precision of these um, recognizers or classifiers, as they're now, you know, depending on which software program you use. A lot of it has to do with we don't have good libraries of the breadth of calls of birds. And so there is a need to kind of capture that in a very systematic way. Um, and I think that's where a lot of work needs to happen. Yeah, because you've got a lot of regional variation with yep. species too, yeah. haven't you? Um, another point is that um, I may have some historic uh, soundscapes from the Bunyip State Park oh. if your student yeah. is interested. Yes. In, we would in actually. touch with me. Yeah, I'll yeah. have to look through my um, my records, but I certainly have lived in that area for a long time and done a lot of recording up there. So fantastic! Yeah, be good if it's useful. Yes, okay. it would especially be. pre not pre the two thousand and nine fires. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, yeah. and nocturnals. And nocturnals. Yeah, yeah. My specialty is nocturnal. Oh, fantastic! Calls, but still, yeah. there's a lot of diurnal. Yeah, that's um, what we need more recording. knowledge about. So yeah. okay, thank you. Yeah. I was just wondering if the um, acoustic recordings can be used to sort of give um, biologists in another area a heads up that, hey, we're losing diversity in this area, so that's going to impact further up the food chain? Ah, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. Um, we are trying to kind of get a bunch of... So there seems to be a critical mass now, within Victoria at least, of, of sort of capturing the work that's done in the acoustic space and how we can put people in touch with other people who have data sets that are interested in. Um, it's sort of a little bit like trying to catch all the pieces before they disappear and kind of put in place best practices. And, and really for, for a researcher who's trying to figure out a particular area, knowing what data sets have been collected before them could really be helpful. So yeah, I mean, the, the purpose of it is really to kind of make it available for whatever people are interested in. Because, you know, I don't study insects, but there are insect recordings in there, so someone else might find that interesting. Yeah. That's why museums are really good. Uh, yeah, I was just um, actually echoing what other, to use a sonic analogy, uh, what other people are saying about, uh, I guess, um, recordings pre-existing. Um, I, mean, I guess since the 70s when um, d um, technologies improved, you know, yep. microphones and, and DATs and uh, digital recordings. Um, uh, uh, soundscape, um, Australia became a bit of a leader in creating soundscapes for museums and zoos like yep. uh, overseas. Uh, we were kind of leaders in that. And so there's quite a few people, uh, you might be aware of some of them, and yeah. I, I know some of them who have you know, quite extensive recordings yep. that, uh, from, from various uh, sort of locations and habitats throughout Australia and Indonesia. Yeah. And um, yes. they eventually, <laughs> um, you yeah, know, they're keeping their, uh, some of them collections safe and, and the, keeping them to themselves, but other people are very ha happy to make them available. And uh, yeah, so it enables us, yeah, to step back in time, to yeah. uh, time travel back and get some indication about, uh, yeah, the previous uh, state of things, I guess. Yeah, yeah so and I think that's a really powerful approach that we haven't really been able to do because 
getting all that data together has been a bit tricky and we're really only just starting to archive the sounds that we're collecting into our collection just for a variety of different reasons there's a lot of things that have to get into the right place before we can do that so i think now is a really good time to kind of follow on with that um that sort of trajectory of of trying to capture historical soundscapes as well as the ones that we're collecting nowadays yeah, and probably yeah and also i suppose that you know the sound world is now becoming you know receiving much more consideration yeah both from a, a scientific but also yeah. from an aesthetic and sort of social point of view and so people are very very interested in um uh, um listening to the world as well as observing and um um yeah so it's 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 um i guess an, an area that we'll we'll see a lot more sort of development and growth in as people um yeah the technology is evolve and that kind of thing anyway just to comment really yeah yeah no that's yeah. fantastic yeah. yeah and i think now that everything's most things are moving to digital it's a little bit easier to share the data and it's easier to link them up so i think we're hoping that that's the the problem for a lot of historical sound archives is actually been transferring their um sounds to digital and so that's a very laborious and expensive process but if we're actually recording or we already have them in digital formats then we can actually do a lot more yeah yeah got time for one last question hello i actually have two questions <laughs> but that's okay um sign with me <laughs> <laughs> um how did you get into the field of bioacoustics and what's one of the most memorable sounds um you've recorded or strange or Oh, yeah, well, that's an interesting one. Um, so to be brutally honest, the reason I got into sound recording is because, as you can probably tell, I wasn't born in Australia. And so I had to, um, I haven't been here for more than, I was we've sort of moved here um, eight years ago. And so having a background in North American songs is a very different landscape here. And so for me, the idea of going out into the bush and saying, oh, what is that? What is that? What is that? And I was like, okay, well, if I can record them, at least I can kind of get back to them. And then this is the same time that um, Cornell Lab of Ornithology was developing their sort of birding, um, learning how to um, bird based on spectrograms. And so the idea was really appealing to be able to kind of um, break it down into just, instead of just the sounds, but also the sounds and the spectrograms. Because for me, I'm, I'm much more of a visual person. And so to be able to see those patterns um, it's actually a lot faster for me than to try and listen to them. And you can scan visually a lot faster than you can listen to anyway. So it sort of really was a, a need in my own part to kind of better understand the soundscapes that were, um, we were going into. Um, as for the sound I recorded, hmm. So I'm somewhat partial to gang gang huck twos, primarily mm -hmm. because we can, um, hear them in my backyard and it's sort of like the whole family is like, oh, I can hear that. They know that it is right away. Um, but I, I kind of like the plains wanderer call too. There are a few other species that sound like plains wanderers, so it's a bit tricky um, if you're in different habitats to be able to tell them. But just the the bird themselves is such a strange sound that comes from this tiny little bird. So so I've sort of I guess so it's a tie I have too. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Okay, let's join in, in thanking Karen once again. Thank you.